Hey, let's talk about Kit and Yod for Olim. So I've heard somebody state that you move to the land of Israel. Actually, I heard someone quote this in the name of Rabbi Vadi Yosef. Um, you move to the land of Israel, you now take on Min HaGerot Yisrael, and that means you just do what Maran, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, says, and you now eat rice and beans. I heard this stated by a number of apparently knowledgeable people in the name of Rabbi Vadi Yosef. I'm now going to read you what's stated by the Rishon Metzion, the current chief rabbi of Israel, the son of Rabbi Vadi Yosef, in his book, Kitzur Shulchan Aruch Yalkut Yosef, based on the Yalkut Yosef, the laws are, uh, well, you know, Kitzur and Gimel, Rice on Pesach, Seif Aleph, Orez v'chomine kitniot, or v'chlal afunim, Rice in all forms of kitniot, including um, peas, and he goes through all these things, they're permitted to eat on Pesach, and so on and so on and so on, I think we're quite aware of this. V'acheinu Ashkenazim, our brothers the Ashkenazis, Nohagim isu v'pesach v'orez v'kitniot, they have a custom that it's forbidden to eat beans or kidney or whatever they are, and rice, there is no reason for them to change this minhag, even if they were to perform some kind of releasing a vow. Now why I mention this is because I'm not sure why, but on the subject of kidney or, I continually hear people quote important halachic authorities, not from the text, and they say it backwards. They say backwards. The one who permits it, they say forbids. The one who forbids, they say permits. So for that reason, I ask you to indulge me that there's a number of slightly complicated texts. I'm going to read words directly from the original source. So I'm not going to be paraphrasing. The only people I will paraphrase are people who told me things personally, which is not too many people. Um, okay. So based on that, apparently, according to Rav Avadji Yosef, it is incumbent on Ashkenazim to keep the custom of not eating kidney on. And if Rabbi Vajir Yosef says it's incumbent, I think most Ashkenazi rabbis would agree. Okay? Um, Rabbi Vajir Yosef then goes through all the rules of what happens, you know, why it's forbidden for a Sephardi to trick an Ashkenazi to eating kidney on and other such things, you know, whatever exactly that is. And they have to inform an Ashkenazi whenever there's food containing kidney on. Okay? That's all very well. That's all very by the by. That's what all of that is. Apparently, the custom of keeping kitten yacht is a very, very old custom. Now, what really that means, I'm not, I'm not 100% clear. In the Talmud, there's a discussion that somebody, Rabbi Yochanan ben is his name, says that it is permitted to make matzah out of rice, and that if you do it wrongly, it turns into chametz, and you're chayav, you've transgressed the Torah prohibition of eating chametz if you eat rice that is cooked wrongly. Everybody disagrees with Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri. The standard practice is Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri is not accepted. But based on this, there appears to be a custom not to eat rice. In fact, this is added because there's a discussion about a Seder plate where a certain rabbi puts rice on his Seder plate instead of where we would put the egg. And someone says, how could he do that? It must mean that he doesn't even have a custom not to eat rice. Implying that some people, perhaps even in Babylon, had a custom not to eat rice on Pesach. So that's rice. Most of the issues we have at Kitten Yacht are not rice. They are much more than rice. So I'm going to read another source. This source is called, the, it, although it's quoted the Sefer Mitzvot Katan, it's actually a note on the Sefer Mitzvot Katan. It's unauthored. We don't know who wrote it, but it's assumed to be written by Rabbeinu Peretz. Vala Kitniot, regarding Kitniot, Kagon Foish or Foili, Varish, whatever exactly they are. This was written somewhere in southern France, is the general assumption, um, in around the year 1200. Our rabbis have made a practice that there is forbidden to eat these, and we don't eat these on Pesach at all. That's important, because until this note is written, I, we haven't ever seen anything about rice. The Talmud says there's an issue with rice. Um, Rav Vadi Yosef brings himself about there are many Sephardi groups today that do not eat rice. Or if they do eat rice, they only eat rice that is freshly cooked in front of them. Okay, as such, there are limits, right? Some people, but that's rice. Now here we've seen the smuck um, uh, brings in, or the notes on the smuck, that there's a tradition to abstain from more than just rice. Okay. I'm now going to read the Shulchan Aruch. And the Shulchan Aruch interestingly actually quotes this in relation to the laws of matzah. Because there's a discussion of what are you allowed to make matzah out of. You're allowed to make matzah out of, it says, matzah. These are the things which matzah has to be made out of, for you to fulfill the mitzvah of matzah. And conversely, that means something made out of any of these products can become chametz. 
Chitim, Seorim, Kusmin, Shibolet, Shual, Vashifon. Wheat, wheat, barley, oats, spelt, and rye. Okay? These are things you can buy. There are lots of uh, amusing health breads if you go to the right store you can buy made from these particular items. Um, this is what matzah can be made out of. And it says it's best to do it with best to do it with wheat. Of a lobo ores, not with not with rice. Vesharmina kidney, not with any other kind of beans or whatever they are. Vegam Einam Bayni de Himutz, these things can never become chametz. Whatever you do with them, it's not chametz. Umutala sotmehem tafshil, you can cook anything you want from this. With and tafshil means cooking with water in a wet way. Any of those things don't become chametz. Haga, the Ramah adds, Vyesh Osrim. Some people say it's forbidden. The custom in Ashkenaz is that we're machmir and you don't change it. And he says if it falls a bit in your pot, big deal, you take it out. So we apparently have a fixed custom that we do not eat this in Ashkenaz, whatever that means exactly. And it's also permitted to keep kidneyot in the house. So chametz, have to get rid of it. We're all cleaning it out. Kidneyot, we don't have to get rid of. You don't have to sell your kidney out. don't have to arrange your kidney out. So just put them aside and don't eat them. Uh, oh my, this is my, my wife's particular thing. After the house is clean for Pesach, she then gives my, my children Bamba and Cheetos and Doritos and all of these things they're not going to eat on Pesach where the crumbs don't count. Now, that doesn't work for the ideal of the perfect spring-cleaned, crumb-free house that our mothers always desired. Uh, but that's, that's the compromise my wife makes with the children. That halacha in itself is okay, but the next line is what actually starts the whole problem. Vezera akliza, and a, and a um, seed we call akliza, which I'm not sure what that is. Ve anis, anis is aniseed. Ve ailanda, which is kolendra, um, which is coriander. Einan minei kitniot. These are not kitniot. Umutar lochlam Pesach. It's fine to eat these on Pesach. They're not kitniot. There is a note. It's quoted, it's from the Yedid Nefesh, it's quoted in the Magan Avram. Tov lahachmir shelo lechol anis v'kimel ad yom acharon. It's still best not to eat anis and kimel. Now, kimel we didn't see mentioned in the previous line, but anis we did. So apparently there are these things which the Ramah says you're allowed to eat them, and someone else says, ah, it's probably best you shouldn't eat them. Why shouldn't you eat them? Ki ir shalavaram yafeh. It's difficult to sort them properly. I assume that means there might be chametz inside. Why this is important is we're now seeing a reason why we have this supposed reason not to eat it. Now, rice, we sort of understand why you're not meant to eat rice, because apparently rice is sort of like chametz, even though it's not chametz. There's a tradition stretching back to the Talmud. Apparently, we don't eat beans. So the question is, what are the reasons we don't eat beans? Or these other things on Pesach. And so over here we've stated a reason is because they're apparently mixed up with things that can become comments. So what you're going to do is you're going to throw your beans in the pot and you're not going to realize there's going to be barley or wheat inside of it and your pot is going to boil up barley and wheat and that's going to make comments. And comments on Pesach can never be nullified. This whole concept that, you know, if you drop a little bit of milk in the Sholent, if it's less than one in 60, that the Sholent is acceptable, you're just not allowed to do it deliberately even if it tastes better. Um, you're not allowed to do that. But with chametz, it doesn't work. On Pesach, any amount of chametz makes the entire food not fit to be eaten. So, apparently, that could be the case if there is wheat or barley mixed in with your beans that you throw in your pot. In fact, that's the specific reason that is quoted by the notes on the smak that I mentioned before. It says, these things are things you throw in a pot, just like wheat and barley. Now, uh, it's uh, amusing, because we have, this is the first proper reference to a cholent made with beans and barley in the uh, halakhic text. There's no specific mention here of kishka, but I'm sure it's coming there somewhere. Um, nonetheless, this means that the, this is the one reason we have. Now, there's an extra reason mentioned here. It calls it midi the midgun. Something that is processed in the same way as grain. Now, it's not sure whether that means it's a similar shape of grain. Some people make a big deal about anything that somehow has a grain-like shape. It could be uh, the fact that it splits in half. That's almost the definition of legumes. Um, it could be that, that the way it's sorted is like grain is sorted, or the way it's peeled is like grain is peeled. People cannot agree on exactly what that is. 
And there's a final definition we haven't got to yet that is never quoted explicitly, but is quoted adversely, which is that if it can be turned into flour. Now, that's interesting because that's not mentioned in any of the earlier halakhic texts, unless you think that's what midgan is, where dagan means grain. Midgan, which generally is meant to assume to be something to do with the shape or style of the grain, maybe it means that because grain gets turned into flour. Has anyone here ever made flour? <coughs> if you get in one of these proper matzah factory, chugim, they actually start with grain for you to make fresh at the time. Um, I'm assuming there'll be a whole bunch of them run um, in this area in general. Like I went to one actually in the yeshiva last year. It was, it was a lot of fun and very messy. Um, so based on this, we now have a tradition of not to eat certain things. We already see a tradition that someone says you shouldn't eat these things and someone else says, actually, if you want, you probably can, but I don't, which already is giving us a bit of confusion. So what we haven't done is define exactly what kitten yod is. And I'm going to give us another source here that shows why it's so diff- confusing to define. So in the Aruch HaShulchan, which I've actually come back to only about 100 or so years ago, um, there is a discussion, once again, the Siman starts talking about how to make matzah and it veers into kitten yod, because kitten yod is something you can't make matzah with. And so the Aruch HaShulchan starting talking about what you can't make matzah with, he mentions a number of things. V'chein tatriki shakorin grika or rachka. These things, eno min tvua. It's not a kind of grain, you can't make matzah with it. V'chein chitei tiras shakorin traksa vites or kukorodza. Kukorodza is Polish for um, uh, corn. Someone here may know Yiddish or German better than me, or kikos. Hugam ken min kitniot, that's also kitniot. Vechen fulim levanim, similarly, um, white bean, shikorin fasolus, that's um, Polish for bean, or babalach, which may be another language, I don't know. Hugam ken min kitniot, and he's mentioning a whole bunch of things here, and he says, these are kitniot, and because they're kitniot, you cannot make matzah out of them. And this is interesting because the definition of kitniot here is not things we have a tradition not to eat. The definition of kitniot are things you're not allowed to use to make matzah. Now this adds to the confusion because once again, is kitniot a list of things we don't eat? Or is a kitniot uh, you know, a list of everything that we didn't think of eating yet, basically, if I can put it that way in a simplistic fashion? So there is a longer list. I won't go into all of it now. Nonetheless, there's a lot of products. This is the first time, like um, corn, that they're mentioned in Hahi texts. The problem is, is they're not mentioned as being kitniot, meaning Ashkenazim don't eat them. They're mentioned as being kitniot, as in, you cannot make matzah out of them. It's in the same siman, but it's the siman basically segues from taking some kind of produce, grinding it up into flour and making matzah, to, oh, and these are the kinds of produce that Ashkenazim don't eat on Pesach. And it's not clear where one bit starts and one bit ends. So I'm now going to switch to a, 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 a question that was asked of Rab Moshe. Now, this is a great example of a question that I've heard paraphrased, quoted wrongly and right so many times. I only read it the first time on Friday, and I'm glad I did. It's from 1966. We want to know what's the deal with peanuts. Lots of people ate them on Pesach. And that means in America and in Europe, in the old country. And um, the, the rabbi who wrote the letter, and the author of the letter to Rabbi Moshe was shocked. He says, I've heard they make flour out of peanuts. Someone, is there, did you buy peanut flour in stores in Modern? Okay, sorry. <laughs> And also apparently the way you grow peanuts is like kidney oil. It's not like nuts, which grow on trees or similar things. But really, the rabbi asked the question, you know that none of that is relevant. We don't care what it looks like when it grows. And we don't care if you make flour out of it. Because... It's not simply that anything that you make kemach, it's forbidden. There's nothing that people like to make flour out of or starch like potatoes. Everyone got their potato flour recipes ready? Okay. Not just in this country, America, Europe, also in Europe, 
וגם בדורות הקודמים ומעולם לא חשו לישראל זה, for many generations people have been doing this, no one was ever concerned that potatoes were kidney on. Now people quote a halacha in the name of the Hatam Sofa, where the Hatam Sofa said it's forbidden to eat kidney on, eat potatoes because they're kidney on, because you can make flour on them. I won't go into it now, they're misquoting what the Hatam Sofa said, which said there may be reason not to eat it. Um, Chug Hatam Sofa, which is in theory the followers of the Hatam Sofa, make a very large quantity of potato flour products on Pesach. Um, it, I, what's the problem is that this particular halacha has been quoted by lots of people to prohibit things other than potatoes. Because one authority said that potatoes are forbidden because you make flour in them, even though potatoes aren't forbidden. Therefore, other things are forbidden because you can make flour with them. And really, I mean, once again, I could ask my local nutritionist, is there something that grows out of the ground that if you know how to do it, you can't make some kind of flour out of it? You know, it may not be good for making cakes or bread or whatever. You can make flour out of virtually anything. It just will miss certain qualities. You just got to work out what to add into it to cover what it is missing. Okay. Now, I'm going to skip a little bit of it here. Nonetheless, he, is, he goes through a number of the things we've mentioned now, especially this concept of, oh, there are some things that a certain rabbi says you can't have, even though there are masses, you can have them. He says, we just don't like to have them anyway. Only thing we have on matters like this is what is explained explicitly that it's our custom to say it is forbidden. That which is known and publicized. When something new comes up, you don't say, oh, that might be kidneyot. Kidneyot is the custom that our parents practiced and that their parents practiced. And they told us this is what we don't eat. A new thing turns up, we don't say, maybe it's kidney oil. I don't know if that means that maybe people ate this hundreds of years ago and we forgot about it. Um, or whether kidney oil means that there's some secret, I don't know, idea that the Torah knows all knowledge and therefore buried in the Torah is the idea of kidney oil. No, if it isn't our custom, it's not our custom. He brings a different idea that this is a custom that wasn't a gzeira of Chachamim that got together, a group of sages got together and said, we need to be careful because of this and not do it. Because then they make a set of rules and principles to follow by. And there are many things we do today because the sages said, we have to be careful about this. And some of these rules date back to Talmudic times and some of them are newer. It is clearly known that there was never a time where a group of sages got together and said, we have a problem, we have to stop people eating kitten yard on Pesach. It never happened. A group of people here stopped eating this and a group of people here stopped eating that and that's what they stopped. The fact that people in one country stopped eating this and people in another country stopped eating that doesn't change anything. Okay? The fact that people in South Africa stopped eating sunflower oil and the people in England stopped eating peanut oil right, doesn't mean that you've changed the minhagim between the two different countries. So, as such, Rav Moshe concludes with... Um, as such, his, his ruling is as follows. Lachen gamma peanut lo asru Peanuts are not forbidden in many communities. This is written in 1966. Where there's no custom, there is no reason to bring a prohibition. There is no reason to be strict on these kind of things. There's no reason to be strict. If you have a custom not to eat peanuts, asur gamba peanut, gamba peanuts, Okay, so they can't eat peanuts. Ten hekshir shalonit arev sham chametz. So if you've been asked to give supervision for a product that contains peanuts, so you write on it, this is a chametz-free product. And people who have, don't have a problem eating peanuts will eat this product. And so you say, Kosh Pesach contains peanuts. That's what Rav Moshe rules. That's the reason they give a hechsha on peanut oil for this reason. The peanut oil is produced in a way that it is completely free of chametz and completely free of all other impurities. And if you eat peanuts, you eat it. If you don't, it says peanut oil, you look for a different oil to cook with. This is what Rav Moshe says. It's interesting because people like to publicize the number of Rav Moshe's hetes. This one is not publicized heavily. I was talking with someone who asked, why doesn't the OU accept peanuts, soy, and a number of other things if Rav Moshe appears to say that it's permitted? I'm not sure why they started, but I've said, OUP has become a health and dietary standard 
I don't know if people know that um, dietitians in the United States tell people you should not eat soy. So just now go to the supermarket, right? It's the right time of year and buy a year's worth of the following product that says OUP on it. There'll be no soy in it and there'll be no um, peanut in it. There'll be no corn in it, whatever it is that you can't eat. And OUP has become a gold standard for allergies. Okay, and this is an issue with OUP. There's a number of other things where OUP has worked in this particular fashion to do with milk allergies. Uh, so not with P-O-U-D, which is with milk allergies, um, where other hexas in the United States are more lenient on things not putting a D on it. The OU puts a D on anything, or virtually anything, where there's a milk allergy issue because they've become a de facto allergy standard as well as customer standard. Now, this helps us, I guess. If people buy more OUP products, there'll be more OUP products made and, you know, that helps us. But, well, someone else can supervise the peanut oil, I guess. I, I haven't been in America for Pesach ever. I bought a lot of American products in other countries. So I'm not sure exactly how these things are, uh, are distributed. So if you keep something and you go to another country, and that is the kind of minhag of the country to keep whatever, even though you've never done it before because it wasn't available in your country, what takes precedence? So in, in, th in theory, in theory, if you read the halachas simplistically, if you go from a place with one custom to a place with another custom, you keep the stringencies of both places. But that is a narrow halacha. If you move from a completely Ashkenazi community that everyone eats peanut butter, out of South Africa, and you move to an Ashkenazi community where nobody eats peanut butter, England, <laughs> right? Okay, but if you move to Modiin, where there are such a range of traditions, how can you say I'm being lenient by eating peanut butter like it in South Africa when half of my neighbours are eating peanut butter, even though some of them don't eat peanut butter? But, you know, they're English. They eat sunflower oil, even though I would never eat sunflower oil. Okay, so where am I mixing up my customs here? I should, I should put a story. You have a question? Let's just say for the residents of Modi and of Buchman, for example, perhaps there might be an Ashkenaz shul. But the rest of the schools... It's not an Ashkenaz shul. The dominant schools are all Nusach Sor, the Israelis. I'm not... That personally, that's, that's no relevance to any of these customs. Um, it's another amusing shul, what is the origin of the Nusach dubbed in many shuls in, 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 in Israel, but it's a very new Nusach, and it's very unlikely more than 90% of the people ever prayed that min Nusach more than 150 years ago. That's a separate issue. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be praying it. It has no relation to their traditions. Okay. I, I worked in Poland... And every group comes to Poland based on a number of scholarly books and says, ah, we're in Poland, all the shuls are Nusach Svarad, because that's what we read. About a quarter of the shuls in Poland are Nusach Svarad. It's, I don't know where it came from. I was taught that before I went to Poland. Uh, I was taught because it was all Hasidic, it was all Kabbalistic, whatever. No, no. All, all of the Polish translations, this is so off the topic, but interesting, all the Polish translations of Sidorim before the war were all from Nusach Ashkenaz. All the machzorim, all nusach Ashkenaz, so on and so on and so on. These traditions, people link them. They're not linked. It's, it's a random thing. It has, it has no relationship. I do have to add to that the Hasidic groups that seem to favour nusach Sfarad are the, the strictest about the customs of kidney oil. Again, so okay, I'm going to run along because there's two more relevant things before I try and make this a bit more personal about customs. Um, there's two shortim that change this a little. First is the minchat Yitzchak written by Rav Yitzhak Weiss, Diane Weiss, who came from Eastern Europe, moved to Manchester, um, and then from Manchester moved to Jerusalem to be head of the Ada Haredit. And Minha Yitzhak is asked about cottonseed oil. Uh, without reading it too much in the place, the Minha Yitzhak explains why some people permit it, and explains why some people forbid it. And then the Minha Yitzhak says, but cottonseed oil is a lot like flaxseed oil, and a bit like hemp oil. And it says in a number of halakhic sources that hemp oil and flaxseed oil are okay to use to light your candles on Pesach. And since they're okay to use to light your candles, it must mean that's all you can use it for. Okay, and therefore, we don't, use, we don't fry with hemp seed oil or with, um, uh, or with um, uh, flaxseed oil, even though actually those are generally not used as cooking oils. They're not wrong to use, they're not normally used as cooking oils. Um, and therefore, similarly, because cottonseed oil is similar, we shouldn't use that. And as such, the tradition in Manchester specifically became not to use cottonseed oil. Okay. Now, born not that far from the Minchat Yitzchak was the Kloisenberger Rebbe, uh, the Divrei Yatsiv, who was born in Sanz. 
Um, and he moved to America before he moved to Israel. Um, he moved to Netanya. And he wrote issues of Shem and, Kut- uh, of Shem and Kutna. And he compared it to the, the sources that prohibit Shem and Kutna have issues that would also be a problem with olive oil. Without going to what is that now? And then based on all of this, means anyone who eats olive oil, it is permitted for them to eat cottonseed oil on Pesach. So if I can just try and quickly confuse us all a little, right? If you come from London, you use, you use um, uh, sunflower oil, right? If you come from South Africa, you use canola oil and maybe peanut oil. If you come from Australia or America, you use canola oil. I'm sorry, it's not called, I mean cottonseed oil. And then you come to Israel and they use any oil that is called non kidneyon is a different oil. In fact, it's from the Tribune of Midhat Yitzhak. It's only oils that come from trees. Only oils that come from trees, as in nut oils, which basically, be, with the exception of palm oil, which is considered to be like a tree oil, without going into that now. Palm oil is the cheapest of the non-kidney oils in Israel, and I believe is by far the least healthy of the non-kidney oils. There are health benefits to palm oil, but in general, all of... Now, palm oil, in theory, is available in huge quantities in Israel in preparation for Pesach, but in practice is not, because it is bought by the truckload, by all of the factories and all of the caterers at all of the hotels, right? And therefore, palm oil is available about five weeks before Pesach, and then about a week before Pesach. Because in between, everyone, all the people who've pre-ordered it are buying it. Which is the issue that comes out of this we're about to get into now. So I mentioned... Olive oil. Olive oil. In theory, olive oil is completely fine. But there was a source brought here by the Devar Yatsiv, the Klosenberger Rebbe, that points out that the problems these people are having with cottonseed oil is the same with olive oil. I won't go into what the comparisons are. He therefore says, if you eat olive oil, then you eat cottonseed oil. Okay? And they won't use it here. Well, uh, what, who, who's they? Okay. So I asked, I, I was, uh, many people here living in this fair town have had the chance to meet the chief rabbi of Israel um, uh, here and there. I, well, the last time I got to meet him at a seum for the last second, which therefore makes it 55 days ago, or 54 days ago, I asked him, before I gave the shul the question, I asked Rabbi Lau, and I said, what if someone moves from overseas and has a custom to eat a certain product? Does that change because they moved to Israel? And Israel supposedly it's kidney oil. And Rabbi Lau said, if your custom is to eat something, then that's your custom. If your custom is to eat cottonseed oil or peanuts or sunflower oil, then that is your custom. You just simply need to make sure that you're acquiring a product that is reliably according to that for Pesach. Yes? Mm-hmm. Well, that I think it was four years ago, yeah. he came out saying that even people that didn't initially eat canola oil, he allows them to eat canola. He, well, once again, I'm not saying he didn't say that, but how did you hear that? Because unfortunately, I've heard so much misquoting on this. I'm not, not saying that he said something about canola. Okay, maybe. Name on it. They were in Hebrew also, like, like, there is know, an issue here because now we're dealing with an issue of supply. So I used to live in Efrat before I went on Shlichot, and in Efrat, there was no problem in all the local supermarkets finding non kidney oils. Now, we all live in Modiin, and what happens is, is that on the Modi in list next week, some will say XYZ product is available in the following store. And by the time you've even read the post, don't bother waiting for the email to come. Just check the list live. It will be gone. Okay, and the reason why the supermarkets aren't buying as big boxes as they can is they're getting whatever they can because the caterers have grabbed it all. The hotels have grabbed it all. They're getting whatever they can. Okay, and these products will appear and they will disappear. And... I remember joking about this with a Haredi relative. What you need to do for Pesach is three weeks before Pesach, you go to the supermarket. And you go back again every five to six days to different supermarkets because products appear and disappear because depending on when they come off the line and depending on when the caterers buy them. And uh, this is it. That's the reality of Pesach. It's different to we had to supposedly make everything yourself in the old days. Now you can buy it all yourself. You've just got to be the ultimate consumer and live in Rami Levy. I know people would like to do that. It's not really my dream. Um, Okay, that's also true. I was going to say. So, I mean, is that if you go to Modi and let you can find these things. Um, but having said that, people make the next mistake and they assume if you go to Mahadran's supermarket that everything will be kidney off free. And it is not. And the supermarket, the, 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 the supermarket, the Haredi supermarkets at Pesach time are just as disorganized as the non Haredi supermarkets. And the products are all scattered everywhere. And just as many people have accidentally picked up the oil they don't want and left it mixed up with the oil they do want and so on and so on. 
it's just, you know, it's the, it's the festival of the reading glasses. I, I joke. You, know, you need to carefully check exactly what it says. But the question is, is there any good news to find in the reading glasses? Because I've pointed out a lot of bad news. And I actually would like to try and bring some good news and some various things about, about this issue. So firstly, there, is, there are a number of products that appear that if you read the label carefully, state that they're not kidney oil, but they are kidney oil. Uh, I'll give you a number of odd different examples. I haven't seen this for some time. I saw sets of um, salamis produced a number of years ago by Atara um, that said on them, the Lokashash Kitniot Mechil Shemen Kutna, made with cottonseed oil. Right? Once again, they're writing it in Hebrew for people with a custom of eating cottonseed oil. When most people who have a custom of eating cottonseed oil are not Israeli. In fact, I would say those who eat cottonseed oil who are Israeli, they're, they're, um, they're, not, they're not Ashkenazi, without going to this now. Now, Rav Lau apparently distributed something about canola oil. Many, many Yishuvim, specifically, the Rav stands up and says, we eat canola oil. It's very common in Yishuvim. It's extremely common. So, Rav Sobel, I don't know, Didn't Rav Sobel used to live on a Yishuv? I don't know. But I asked him about it. He yeah. said, there's no doubt, everyone allows it. Well, I, I'm careful with the term everyone. So I, I had a friend who, who recently um, stated that she worked out how to make mayonnaise, and she says she'll make mayonnaise for people for Pesach with a recipe that she's used from her mother, um, and she's using the oil that her cousins on, um, in Ben El told her she should use. And I said, that's a problem. She goes, what, are you saying it's kidney oil? I said, I didn't say it's kidney oil. I said, many of the non, the non for, kidney, non for non kidney oil mayonnaises are made with canola oil. And the good ones are properly labelled. They're made with conscious of Pesach canola oil. But you, 55 days ago, when you asked for yeah. Pesach, you didn't ask him specifically, do you allow or not allow canola oil? I didn't. It wasn't my topic. My topic was about your customs from before. Sorry, yeah? I, I just, I remember it was our first year in Israel, so I remember this whole, what do you mean? You can oil. I thought we can't. He said, based on what I remember, and I think that he wrote to residents of Muzim, was that it was in Hebrew. It said that... Anyone in Mosin, basically, based on this, he allows them to eat canola oil, including, he specifically specified mayonnaise that has canola oil as the main ingredient. Okay, so what is the deal with canola oil? Does anyone know where canola oil came from? Rapeseed. What is rapeseed? It is seed. Okay, okay. rapeseed is a non-edible seed that was used for non-edible oils, and in the last half of last century was bred to be a strain that was edible. It wasn't poisonous, it just, whatever the definition of non-edible, once again, ask a doctor or dietitian what that means, it was bred to be edible. So it's controversial that someone could say it's kidney oil because there was never a custom not to eat it because nobody ate it. It was considered inedible because the, whatever there was, I'm not familiar with the exact things, it was not fit for regular human consumption. Canola oil is fit for regular human consumption. We all have far too much of it. Okay. Um, so there's no tradition for canola oil. Canola oil didn't exist before. Okay. It was not used. It was, it was created, but it wasn't created for humans. It was created for other things. Now, it wasn't a poisonous oil, but it wasn't an oil that was regularly eaten. Now, I have to add here, therefore, from a shoot, a very, very important shoot of a rav called... Rav Avram Yitzhak Cohen Cook. Now, Rabbi Cook, everyone likes to talk about his philosophy. And Rabbi Cook, everyone likes to talk about how he loved all Jews. And apparently the Jews in Rabbi Cook's time also assumed that Rabbi Cook was one of these touchy-feely rabbis who makes everyone feel good. And they're very important, these rabbis. We all remember when they turned up to our communities. But deep down, we all thought, we're not going to ask them any serious halakhic questions unless like, we hope they're really leaning on something, right? Now, a lot of people in Israel were not aware that Rabbi Cook, while he was a great touchy-feely rabbi who would love every Jew and hug every Jew he saw and so on and so on and so on, actually probably was the biggest Talmud Chacham in Israel. Most people just assumed he was so nice and so personable and so busy shaking people's hands that surely he just was a nice guy rabbi. Now, Rabbi Cook was asked, um, it's, so, it's so Zionist, he was asked by a group of Breslovers who were producing sesame oil for the purpose of sending overseas for Pesach. I won't go into all of the issues why sesame oil, if sesame is considered kidney oil, should be okay, other than to say that it's done in a dry process that will never get wet. And it was the first time Pesach products were going to be sent overseas from Israel. We can't imagine that. People buying Pesach products from Israel. And it was going to be Breslov sesame oil. And Rabbi Rav Cook inspected their process and he permitted it. 
and a group of rabbis in Jerusalem went nuts. How can you permit the sesame oil? And they just assumed that Rabbi Cook overlooked something. So they sent him a letter and said, sorry, just to let you know that you're wrong. So Rabbi Cook said, by the way, I just let you know that I've checked out the following sources, one, two, three, and I'm sure you quickly responded because you were worried someone's getting something they shouldn't have. Just check it. It's not a problem. It's fine. Now, the first letter was four lines long. The second letter response was eight lines long. Rabbi Cook's next response was 15 lines long. Okay, his last two letters were each 10 pages long, trying to explain to these individuals that they actually may not understand at all what they're talking about here, uh, but in the most respectful, loving way that surely someone who loves all Jews that much can't be that knowledgeable. It was, it just, seriously, if you want to know who loves every Jew in the world, you read Rabbi Cook's letters here. And, and he writes... He complains. He said that they were saying something might be forbidden, and so therefore it should be forbidden. And he said, you can't say that because it's a minhag. And so they got angry at Rav Kook and said, how can you call this just a minhag? So Rav Kook writes, You're complaining I call it a minhag? You need to speak in the language of your teacher. All the people who talk about this call it a minhag. This is a minhag. Don't tell me it's not a minhag. Okay? This is a minhag. He mentions, the Ramah mentions that it is a minhag. This is not chametz. This is not any suspicion that these products are chametz, that you are breaking the laws of Pesach by having them. There's a minhag not to have them. It is forbidden and wrong to call chametz on something which many God-fearing Jews eat. You know, whether these are Sephardim or Ashkafadis, if, there are, if our neighbors are eating rice on Pesach, it is forbidden and wrong. And think of how nasty this is to tell your children that rice is chametz. You can't tell that. You can say we have a custom not to because they're now assuming that your neighbors next door are not religious or whatever that means. They're not reliable. And you're destroying the fabric of the people of Israel by doing this. He mentions more issues. He says, you know, you've got to think about, you know, poor. there are all these reasons to be lenient be on poor people and for all these different things. The people have to eat the way they eat. And you're just trying to say, well, maybe it's forbidden. We should forbid things. Now, Rav Cook is the precedent for stating that if the locally available product is probably acceptable, since it's a minhag, since it's probably acceptable, then it's acceptable. And this, in my understanding, is the basis of the general allowance for canola oil because that is what is available. There is the other oils available, and if someone wants to be careful to only have walnut oil or hazelnut oil in their house, then please do so. You know, either follow the list for when it appears in Super Tov or Rami Levy, go to another supermarket somewhere. There's a great supermarket in Jerusalem that only has non kidney out products on Kanfei Sharim. If you can get there on the week, they have the products you want. Okay, you do it, right? But in the end, you've got to get what you get, or you buy it. You don't have enough. Or it's fine for you. You can do without it, but your kids can't do without it. Or your guests, then you have reasons to rely on it. Uh, you're probably not going to buy an oil with a, that is of a kind you don't, you're not comfortable with. I don't, for example... The most lenient rabbi I've seen in this particular issue here was very strict about sunflower oil, which Ashkenazim eat in London. Okay, and he explained because sunflower oil, we have a clear tradition that Jews have been eating it for thousands of years, and therefore we can't be lenient on sunflower oil. But canola oil, and he basically told, it was the time the rabbi Belazar, my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Yoshua Reich, that all of the yogurts was the issue. All of the yogurts are permitted because the yogurts have canola oil added into them, and because the canola oil was considered by the Rabbanut Rashid list to not be non kidney art, the, the yogurt said, you know, kidney art yogurt's on it. So, what we've got a situation is as follows the Israeli Rabbanut has a list of minimum products that are not kidney art, and anything that's not that, it says, or whatever, there's all these different expressions. That is what many of these things are. What are you going to do? And so I do want to state that I'll give people individual advice, but really people have to decide if they want to eat canola oil, if they're happy eating peanut oil, if they're happy eating sunflower oil, if they're happy eating cottonseed oil, if they're happy eating these oils, then that is fine. But then the next problem comes that, okay, I'm happy eating this oil, but I have friends. I want the friends in the neighborhood to visit me. So there is good news on this particular matter here. I'll go back to the Aruch HaShulchan. The Isu Zek, Heivan Shikibu Avatena Torah, 
Oh, so, sorry, he's mentioned. I'm reading the wrong, reading the wrong bit. Sorry, he's saying that it's forbidden to get rid of it. He shouldn't be very strict on these particular matters here. Um, and he says, All these things we've said they're not forbidden if they fall into a pot of food. Even if there aren't 60, that's the normal magic number against them. Mutar As long as it's not the majority of the food. So the good news, or the, the odd news here is that on Pesach, apparently kosher style is permitted. So as you go to your Sephardi neighbor's house and he says, oh, there's a pot of soup here, but there's a few beans in it. So well, I'll pick out the beans and I won't eat them. Okay, right? Kosher style is permitted. It's not a problem. You don't eat beans, even if they're the minority, because you can see them. So I'll pick them out. Right. A bit of liquid came out of the beans and got into the food. So, okay. Now, uh, maybe if you really don't want to eat beans, you shouldn't eat every meal at that person's house. But if you're at their house and say, try my special soup, you're going to say, I'm sorry, I can't eat that soup because there is liquid that drips out of beans in it. You don't say that. It's not the halacha. If you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. Uh, even more so with oils that are already at, at another lower level. If the oils are there, then whatever, how much of the oil is there? I'm trying to think of a product that really is, well, the oil is something you can see. You know, that it's that much oil in it, like some of those really spongy, boiled and then fried latkes that soak up so much. I don't know. Um, uh, the oil, in theory, normally is a minority of a product. The only issue I personally would have um, is potentially in cafes and restaurants. In Modi virtually none of the cafes and restaurants are non kitneyot How aware the proprietors are of kitneyot is the proprietors. Some of them are very aware. Some of them... They're just simply cooking business as usual without, you know, flour and bread. It's probably... It, there's an issue we have of aim of If it's something you don't eat, you don't deliberately put it in to get rid of it. But what happens is there, so if your neighbour eats this oil and puts it in the food, so you didn't do that, he did it for himself. But if you go to a store and you say, can you make me one of those? Maybe that's an issue. They're going to actually do it for you. But if you buy something that's pre-made, so it's made... Now, once again, how lenient do you want to be on this? This is up to you, you know. I have to admit, I did not even enter the canyon the whole time I was, the whole Pesach last year. And I did not enter the canyon deliberately. It just didn't come to me. But people told me they went into the canyon. There was a lot of food there. Virtually all the food places were open, except for the bakeries. And, they, and the, none of them were kidney out free. And what does that mean? Okay, so you decide what you want to do. And I don't know whether really, they're called kidney out because they use oils that aren't kidney out and they have... I'm assuming many of them don't serve rice because the rules for making rice are very strict and they need to have a mashkiach who's there the whole time to make it. Um, but they may do that. But whatever, they'll have other products and you just push them aside if that's what you want. Okay. Who was that? Who was the source for the last? It was the Aruch HaShulchan. Once again, on the laws of making matzah, so it's tough, tough nun gimma, it's putting for the recordings, if chet. Um, and he states, as long as you can't see it, it is batel. And that's important because it means the most important thing, and this is Rob Cook's whole point, is that we need to be Jews together. We need to not split ourselves up and be the, you know, the English family, can't eat with the South African family, because one of them has canola oil and the other one has, um, uh, has sunflower oil, and so therefore we just wave at each other over, over the balcony. You know. Minhagim on Pesach can go however they go. The lists of Minhagim people have for Pesach, I'm sure you've heard of some of them, are beyond ridiculous. The issue with all these minhagim, and it comes straight from Rav Cook, is as follows. Sorry, David. Ah, please. It's not a problem. Very important. Children are very important. Okay. That's why I left mine with the 13-year-old babysitter. Okay. She's very responsible. Um, the issue is people who are... I'll give you an interesting example. People who've been brought up learning that uh, um, liquid matzahs, like uh, gebrok, damshruya, is... Chametz, as opposed to they eat it, we don't eat it. Many of these people, when they become less religious, have difficulty not eating bread on Pesach. It's an exaggeration because they don't know what is their personal tradition, right? Not to eat matzah that's wet, right? What is a communal tradition? Not to eat beans. And what is the Torah law, right? Not to eat bread, right? And you have to always know the difference. 
And you're not being strict in the long term by not knowing the difference. I mean, maybe in a moment you're being strict. There's a story about a group of Hasidim that arrived, I believe, in America, just before Pesach, and there were bananas. They'd never seen them before, and they saw seeds, and they said to the Rebbe, can we eat these on Pesach or not? The Rebbe said, we'll decide after Pesach. Let's just do Pesach. And the Rebbe, unfortunately, passed away during Pesach, and so they still don't eat bananas. Okay? And it's very well, whatever. You can buy without bananas. You know, my mother never ate bananas in Romania, and she ate nothing but bananas on the boat for six weeks, and she hasn't eaten any of them since. Okay. Whatever. People have so many traditions, and so many of our traditions are actually not based on halakha or rulings. They're based on normative things. In Eastern Europe, many people did not use oil on Pesach. Not even olive oil. They only used fat. My mother tells me this, even in her time in Romania in the 1950s. I mean, this, I guess, was communist Romania, difficult to get kosher Pesach oil. They only used goose fat. They made this whole beautiful pile of goose fat in the month before Pesach, and they used only goose fat. It leads to the custom among certain Hasidic groups today that still today do not eat any dairy. Because since everything is made with animal fat, you obviously can't eat dairy on Pesach, right? Um, uh, there are so many customs, and the customs are lovely. And if they bring your family together... That is wonderful. But if you do not know what is the law, and you don't know not what is the custom, you know what is the custom, and your children don't, they don't get it. So I'm going to say as follows: It is very possible if you want to push yourself extra to find, especially non-kidney products in many places. If you get lucky, or otherwise, it is very possible to do it, and it's also possible to do without. It's possible to do without margarine for you know, and to have slightly less fatty or more fatty cakes. It's possible to do without mayonnaise. It's possible to do without all of these things. But the problem is maybe for you it is, and for your children or your friends it isn't. And it's important. The most important thing you do is you give your children, your family, your friends, a love of the custom, which we have. Because Pesach, what I remember, is the customs, we love them so much. And it really, if it really is terrible that we don't eat any oil on Pesach, or whatever it is we don't eat on Pesach, then we've got a problem here. We've got a problem if keeping Pesach is terrible. And that doesn't mean you should therefore just eat all the rice and all the corn and all the beans. But you've got to make it that you're not hurting yourself and your family. And uh, most importantly, don't let your, your kids cry too much that it was better in Egypt or whatever such it was. <laughs> Are there any specific questions on specific foods people want to ask about? Well, you just said like your kids. Let's say your kids can't live without rice cakes. I don't know, for example. So... I mean, if you decide that you're going to give them rice cakes, it's not hummus, like at what age? Well, I'm difficult to give them rice cakes because of the halakha seems to state we shouldn't touch rice. But I okay, also have difficulty, but, but I also have difficulty if my kids are sitting next to some safari kid eating kosher mm -hmm. pesach rice cakes, yanking them away so that they do not touch these items, as opposed to, if, you, know, so, you know, if it was next to our lovely fellow not so careful you know, non-religious Jew in the park who's eating something that doesn't look like it's kosher Pesach. I have a great difficulty with doing that because I'm now teaching my child that it's chametz and that is messing around with their head. The question for anything, if you wouldn't eat kidney or like bamba, and is there a situation where you maybe could give that to your kid and until what age would that be okay? Yeah, like your kid's at the park and you should make them eating bamba. And so I, 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 I can't see how you could give it to them. When it comes to these things that are more... Well, actually, Bamba already you're doing with... What's the issue with Bamba? Bamba is made out of peanuts, corn, and canola oil. These are the three main ingredients. Um, exactly what the true kinyon nature of each of those three things can be brought into question. It's for you to decide what you believe on those. This is really different to rice cakes, right? Which okay, is very... Okay. So, I mean, once again, I mean, my, my, of course, there are plenty of snacks. Unfortunately, the main reason you can't find any non kidney oil is because it's in all of the chips... Right, and all of the snacks, which have not only been, which have been kosher pesach bleak kidney on for a month and a half, that's where all of your oil is. Okay, there is no shortage of, at the moment, it wasn't that way four years ago. There is no shortage of kidney on free national shim. Right, there is none. There is so many. That's where all the oil is. Okay, it is you know awesome and elite have bought all of the palm oil in Israel. It's also right, and that's where it all is. Um, so I didn't have an issue with that. What I had more of an issue was with the general chocolates. So now in Israel, if you pay attention to the products by Strauss Elite, Unilever, a very significant number of them now have written in very, very fine lettering. Often it's just a, bar, a date coder 
or it's in small lettering, um, or something like that. Now, what exactly lift it is, it actually could be a number of different things. Nonetheless, this is code for, if you don't want to eat kidney on, but you don't want to give yourself an over-restricted list, then it's there. So I was very concerned about chocolate products in Israel because we had an inconsistent supply or they were very expensive. And as of last year, virtually all elite products now have that. Elite products are a great example because these products are produced for sale in the United States and England and Australia and South Africa and they're not so, they were used to not be sold as kidney free in Israel. And now they are, but it's very subtly written on it, right? In very, very, very subtle letters. So, so they are kidney or they're not kidney well, Depends, that's, that's up for you to decide. But, but as opposed to reading the ingredients and saying, am I going to call this kidney on it? It says, Mechil Liftit. So in theory means canola. And already it's been nullified. Well, as I said, I personally don't buy canola oil to use at home. But once it's already been mixed into a product for general consumption, right, especially if it's not a product that I'm mixing into food to give to my guests, then let's put it on the table. I did this actually, I bought Sally Williams' new guy in Australia that they, they were selling, it was a sale in Franklin's Pick and Pay, but, it was, but they put it an announced that this contains canola oil and the customer thought he doesn't approve canola oil, but it's kosher le Pesach if you're happy to eat canola oil. So yes. And it's written in English. Um, so in all these situations that we can just kind of, you know, lots of the times you said, you know, just design for yourself and, you know, like we've had this also, so we should just design for ourselves. Can we just design for us? As in, I can just go home and say, you know, we've thought about it, yeah, we can eat canola oil, we can... You know, well, but, but that's the thing is it needs to be personal. I have difficulty telling people that you should now say you eat canola oil. I have no difficulty telling people you might find very good reasons why you should be eating it. I have to canola oil was actually not considered definitely forbidden in the United States and, America, and Australia through the 60s and 70s. It just was eventually phased out for cottonseed oil in accordance with the leniency of the divrei Yatsiv. Um, and they simply stopped using it, and then it became not used. But canola oil was available in the, in the 70s in the United States commonly, um, and in Australia. They just stopped using it. Uh, and they, were, they just stopped, they just decided it's now kidney. I don't understand what that means. Okay, sorry. Yeah, um, in the States a few years ago, the OU came out and said that any unrefined coconut oil is considered kosher pesa, even if it doesn't say kosher pesa on it. So I don't know if there's OU certified coconut oil here, but it's a good option for desserts. Oh, it is. Well, what's amusing with that is that the OU standard, and it's a standard of every kosher authority in the world outside of Israel, for other reasons, is that any genuine extra virgin olive oil that is cold-pressed is considered kosher le Pesach. So in Poland, we couldn't tell people this, for reasons I want to go into now. And so we told people they were allowed to use for Pesach, this is actually with the communal soup kitchens and everything, the one that said OU on it, even though it didn't say for Pesach. Because that way, they didn't feel themselves buying something that was completely uncertified for Pesach. Without going, it was, it's, uh, now, certain brands are actually OUP all year round, but they're not sent to Europe. Um, they're sent to the United States and other places like that. So olive oil, therefore, in theory, is okay. But in Israel, that is not standard. The, to certify something as being for Pesach without it being certified for Pesach. Um, I, it's always a great example. Is anyone here like quinoa? So I have a great issue with the whole issue of quinoa, which is I know lots of people who never eat quinoa and want to eat it on Pesach to show that it's acceptable. Now, quinoa is a wonderful food. We had it at Seder last year. We'll have it again this year because the person who's coming makes a wonderful quinoa salad, and I appreciate it during the year and on Pesach. Quinoa is an amazing thing because it's, not, it's very difficult to define what it is, um, and I've heard people call it lots of things. It's probably closer to being a berry the reasons to call it kidney on are among the most difficult of anything around, but it's a great thing to be from about. But on the other hand, quinoa is skinned in a very delicate fashion, and it's very important, therefore, if you buy quinoa for Pesach, that it is kosher for Pesach quinoa, because it is often, there's often other substances present when they skin the quinoa. Um, but there's no such thing as non kidney or kidney or quinoa, because it's all produced the same. Yeah. The quinoa here, most of the brands will buy will say, because it's the same brand that makes the beans and the rice. So this is the next issue. So the reason why they don't make all of this, the main reason why kosher Pesach mayonnaise is not produced by the factories is because for whatever reason, the mayonnaise factory have an issue purifying their lines. So the next problem we have is that kosher Pesach supervision comes with the following phrase, the lo hashash kitniyon, which means no concern of kitniyon. And unfortunately, this is halakhically incorrect. It comes from the statement, the lo hashash or le tevel v'shvit, 
There's no concern of these things, which are very important from an agricultural perspective, that if they're put in there deliberately, they can never be, no matter how much stuff falls into them, it can never disappear. Kit and Yacht, we've just found out, if your Sephardi neighbor cooks it, and doesn't deliberately cook it for you, because they cook it for the Sephardi, and especially even more so if it's something that it's like, you're not even sure if it's kidney on, and puts a bit of it in there, then um, it doesn't make a kidney on. But that is not the kashrut standard. The kashrut standard is the lochashash kidney on, allergy standard. Okay? But is that okay? Sorry. Kinwa, this year was considered acceptable. Last year was considered not acceptable. And the year before was considered acceptable. So maybe next year it won't be acceptable. Once again... <laughs> You decide whether you want to have quinoa or not, and you decide whether it's something that has been forbidden. Now, once again, quinoa is for me a very easy example to say, I don't think anyone here has any reason to forbid quinoa other than they never eat it, so why are they eating it now? If you do eat it. If you, yeah. What if you eat it year-round? Uh, there's no reason to forbid it. But if you eat it year-round, and the only one you can find in the store says chashash quinoa, because is it, it's made by the Is it brand, kosher for Pesach? Yeah. That's all that counts. Mm. I mean... A lot, of, like, a lot of other things, like if you buy pepper and salt, right. sometimes the only salt pepper you can buy right. is like... Oh, whole pepper peppercorns. You see, ground pepper is not, not kidney on, but whole pepper is according to the Eidah Okay. What? Sometimes you see no. Yes, you cannot buy whole peppercorns according to the Eidah that are non kidney on, only ground peppercorns. Sometimes you see fruit juice and have ground Okay, but it's okay because you can buy supervised by the Sephardi actions, which is no kidney on. Because once again, kidney on is now not a decision whether you're Sephardi or Ashkenazi, it's simply a standard of things according to the Rabbanon of Israel. And they don't say the pepper's forbidden because all of the Ashkenazi providers make ground pepper, but they don't have whole pepper. You can't make proper chicken soup and get of fish without whole pepper. Ground pepper is a waste of time. Okay, so you're going to need whole pepper. So, um, specifically, I recommend for spices you buy from the brand. The name isn't coming to me now. I believe the name's not coming to me now. Um, but it's, it is uh, either by Pereg, which has, um, sometimes says OUP, sometimes doesn't, depends on the year. But that has um, Badatz Yoridea, or you buy this other brand that has Badatz Bet Yosef. It's all completely kidney off free. I have to add to that many, many canned products say Ada Haredi, not for, not for Pesach on it. That's not because they were checked for not being for Pesach. The Eidach HaRedit has a policy that goes back to old Europe that really the only thing you need on Pesach is, um, is basically wine and matzah and a few other essentials like soda water. And they will, they will supervise other products if someone pays for something ridiculous. But in general, most of their products, they will not supervise for Pesach. And so someone else supervises them for Pesach. It's just because of what they are. So the cans of tomatoes, it's Eidach HaRedit on them, not for Pesach. Not because they're not the Pesach batch, because that's just what it says. And many of them now, year-round, the cans of tomatoes and cans of many things, say kosher for Pesach, not kidney on. Sometimes they're Sephardi hectares. Because the standard is now defined by the Rabbanut of Israel, there's no reason to say, well, the Sephardi might not know what kidney on are. Right. It doesn't make sense. It's the rules of the Rabbanut. What about tomato paste? I remember having a hard time with that. So my understanding is that it's now very easy to find if you... And it says... Uh, um, so the other thing you've got to know is that maybe if you don't know Hebrew so well, especially since it's not doesn't make proper grammatical sense, you might think means it contains kidney on. Right. And, what are, and um, the leaf teeth, is okay to buy that just means it has canola oil on it? And normally it means canola oil. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I don't see an issue with it. I don't like using it for raw ingredient products. I use it for finished products that I will serve on the table and say that is the following. Everyone should know. If you want to eat it, you should happily eat it. Um, specifically found, mainly used in products from Strauss Elite. Strauss Elite has a large number of products with that. The milky ice... That's because you don't eat canola oil. One does eat canola oil. Well, like canola oil, it's straight away out. It's straight away a, a perfect connection that it is made with canola oil. Uh, it's sometimes actually made with cottonseed oil, not canola oil, but so I don't know. If, you can't do well and you can't yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. It's definitely it's it's straight out connection. It's a straight out thing. It's a straight out clear way of letting you know that it is properly kosher pesach. It's not made with other things you don't eat, and it is made with those things only. Okay. Well, what's the percentage in chocolate of? Well, that's also a very good. That's a very good point. It is small, so I could say that soy lecithin is a very important ingredient in manufactured chocolate. Soy lecithin is a very important good manufactured chocolate. It keeps, the, it keeps the chocolate the way people expect it to be. So I was told by the chocolate man. Um, so what, you get a film 
sometimes white at the top, and mm. sometimes it's past expiry date, and you just get like, like oh, white yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like the white is actually normally caused by temperature change, actually. Mm. Right, because, yeah. the, because the oil separates. So I was told by the chocolate man. I'm, sorry, the, the chocolate man, uh, was it Holy Cacao, makes, uh, makes special OUP chocolate for Pesach, because he now puts soil in in the regular chocolate, unfortunately. Um, his father is from the Bracha, so I haven't been annoying him for the kosher of Pesach chocolate. Uh, but I highly recommend holy cacao chocolate for Pesach and otherwise.